Yes, it turned on. <coughs> it turned on. Fire. Testing. Okay. As Christ's ambassadors, they seven the Adventists are to search the scriptures to seek the truth that has been hidden beneath the rubbish of error. And every ray of light received is to be communicated to others. One interest will prevail, one subject will swallow up every other. Christ our righteousness. No Christian organization, folks, or denomination is clearly or fully presenting this vital truth. Neither the Roman Catholic Church nor the Calvinist or Armenians denominations are doing so. That is why God raised to me the Advent movement. Now I'm going to start with, with, with the illustration of this, which I covered already, but we need to review it. The universal sin problem illustrated. These two men represent the two extremes of the human race. One is called Mr. N and one is Mr. B. I wonder who these are. <laughs> okay. Mr. N is Nicodemus. A Pharisee, a very good guy in his own eyes at least. Then you have Barabbas, who was one of the criminals that was Pilate, you know, pulled out at the time of Christ's trial. Everyone else, that's all of us, is in between that is, together, these two men represent the entire human race. You know, the world is made up of good sinners and bad sinners. And in between sinners. But we are all sinners. Some good, some bad, and some in between. What is the difference between these two men? Okay, we need to look at the difference. The difference between these two men has to do with behavior. And I'm quoting two statements from Paul. One before he was converted and one after he was converted. Philippians 3 verse 6 says, Regarding the righteousness of the law, I was blameless. That's how he felt about himself as a Pharisee. Then you turn to Titus 3 verse 3, which is after conversion. And he says to Titus, who is a Gentile, You and people, me and my people, we are all a bunch of sinners. <laughs> That's what did to Paul when he was converted. He realized that he was a sinner in need of a savior. Yet in God's eyes, both are sinners. Let's look at Romans 3, 9 to 20. You see, Paul, whenever he explains the gospel, all begins with the sin problem. And in chapter, in Romans, he starts with chapter 1, right up to chapter 3, Verse 20. Now, I, uh, on Friday I dealt with this, but I want to, some of you may not have been here. In chapter 3 of Romans, in verse 9, which is the conclusion of his argument, what then? Are we better than they? The we is the Jews, the they is the, the Gentiles. And his answer, not at all. For we have previously charged or proven, both Jews and Greeks, just Gentile, that they are all under sin. And the word under means rule by. That was a term used in Paul's day for slaves. You know, a slave has no freedom. So anyone who claims that sin is a choice have not understood the Bible. Yes, we can choose the right thing, but we cannot do it. So what good is a choice if you can't keep it? And Paul will bring that out in Romans 7. I hate evil, I want to do good, I choose to do the right thing, but in practice I'm failing. So he quotes a lot of texts from the Old Testament to prove his point. But what I want you to see is the conclusion, verse 19 and 20. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that is ruled by the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. What a predicament. And then verse 20. Paul goes on to say, therefore, this is the conclusion, by the deeds of the law, no flesh, that is no human being, 
will be justified in his God's sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Isaiah 64 verse 6 says the same thing. All we like sheep have gone what? Astray. We have all turned to our own way. And this own wayness is the essence of the sin problem. Okay, let's go on now. Therefore, Ultimately, both end up in the same place. It doesn't matter how good or how bad one is. Where do they end up without a savior? The grave. What is the wages of what? Sin. What is the problem? The problem is not their behavior, self-righteousness or sinful acts, but the nature of what? Sin. David wrote in Psalms 51 verse 5, I was shaped in iniquity from my mother's womb. And the word iniquity in Hebrew means bent towards self. So we are born selfish. My son was born. At three months old, he decided breakfast was at three in the morning. And he rang the breakfast bell. You know what that means? He opened his mouth and in un no uncertain terms, he said, time for breakfast. And I woke up Jean and said, Jean, Chris is hungry. <laughs> so she fed him. And then she thought it's time for him to go back to bed. And he said, nothing doing. Now it's time to play. So she would wake me up and say, that's your turn. <laughs> we call it shared responsibility. And I tried my best to put him to sleep. Finally at 6.30, when it was my time to get up, because I had a class at 7.30, he fell asleep. Who taught him to be selfish? It is part of his very nature. We are born with an egocentric nature. And as Psalm 58.3 says, the wicked go astray right from the womb. <laughs> so here is our problem. It is this sin, and I explained this yesterday, I'm going to repeat it, this sin nature. See, sin is a, both a verb and a noun. This sin nature that makes us sinners. Our sins, behavior, only prove what we are by nature. Paul said in Romans 5.12 that sin entered the world through one man. And that sin brought death. And then in chapter 5 verse 19, by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So God is not blaming you for being born a sinner. But we can blame Adam, okay? And in Ephesians 2 verse 3, these are texts that I've read yesterday, so I'm just going to review it. Paul says, we are by nature under the wrath of God. By nature. So this is our predicament. Now the new, and I, I, I'm, this is just a review. The New Testament presents two categories or definitions of sin. The first is sin as a verb. This has to do with X or behavior of mankind. And I've given you the Greek word in English letters. Hamatano is referring to the verb of sin. And verbs have to do with action. The second is sin as a noun, which has to do with our condition, our nature, hamatia. Did I tell you the, the story of the orange tree? Yeah. Yeah, with the sugar. Yeah, with the sugar. My daughter learned the hard way that the real problem is not with what you feed the tree with. It's with the nature, the DNA of the tree. And our DNA is, is, is the DNA of sin. Okay. While we humans have the ability to alter our behavior, our sins, we are absolutely helpless to deal with sin as a nature or condition. When I, you know, when I became an Adventist, I had to change my behavior. I was told that to be an Adventist, you must learn to eat peanut butter. <laughs> now that is wonderful in America. Don't try it in Africa. You know why? Because they store the peanuts in just big beans that are made of, of straw and they form a mold and that mold produces cancer. So, when you go to Africa, 
buy peanut butter that is produced overseas, but never in Africa. We, I had a close friend, you know, who loved peanut, and I warned him, but he couldn't get, give it up. He died of cancer. Now, Jeremiah 13, 23 says this, Can an Ethiopian change his what? And I would use this all the time in Ethiopia. <laughs> or a leopard, can it change its spot? How can we, who are by nature sinners, produce righteousness? That's the issue of Jeremiah 13, verse 23. Paul calls this nature the law of sin in our members. You know, and he brings this out in Romans 7. Look, please turn to Romans. I want to explain something that you need to know. You see, in Romans 7, verse 14 to the end, Paul uses the pronoun I, the personal I, 21 times. And this has caused a big issue in the Christian church, including our own. Is Paul referring to himself before he was converted or after he was converted? You missed the point, folks. He's not discussing himself. Remember the principle. I am all things to all people that I may win some. That is his, his policy. If you look at Romans 7, Start with verse 1. Do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the what? Law. That the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. So this chapter is addressing only a segment of the church of Rome, the Jews. Now the word law to the Jews meant what? To the Adventists, Ten Commandments. But these are not Adventists. These are Jews. To the Jew, what does the word law mean? Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. Yes, the Mosaic law, the Pentateuch. And you know, in the Mosaic law, there is the law of marriage. And you know what? Paul is not discussing marriage. He is using the law of marriage as an illustration. Look at verse 2 and 3. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. And we use this all the time in marriage ceremonies. Until what do us apart? Death. Because that's what the law says. Okay? But if the husband dies, she is released from the law, that is the law of marriage, of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called what? Adulteress by the law. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Now what Paul is doing here, he is explaining verse 1. What does Paul say? The law has dominion over us as long as we are living. Am I correct? The moment we die, the law can no longer condemn you. And I can promise you one thing. The moment you die, the IRS law will never, never bug you again. <laughs> Am I correct? It may bug your family, but not you. That's the fundamental principle of any law. Okay. Now here's a woman that is married to a man. And somehow this marriage is not a happy one. She finds another man. She wants to marry him. But she cannot legally marry him until the husband what? Dies. So one day she puts arsenic in his orange juice. <laughs> and he drinks it. Does he die? You have not understood the text. Who is the first husband? The law. Who is the wife? We are. Until heaven and earth pass, not even one dot or tittle can pass away for the law. The law cannot die. So this woman cannot marry the second man legally because there is a problem. Because the, her husband refuses to what? Die. So how does God solve the problem? Look at verse 4. Jesus, this is the second man, says to her, if your husband cannot die, refuses to die, you must die. And she says, if I die, how can I marry you? Oh no, I'm not asking you to commit suicide. Let me take you unto myself. Let me put you to death 
so that your old life dies and I raise you with my life. Look at verse 4. Who dies? Not the law. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to whom? To the law. Through the body of Christ. That you may be married to another, to him who has raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. So he's explaining to the Jewish believers of Rome that as long as you are under the law, because the Jews were very strong, they were emphasizing the law, you will never meet the law's demand. So what he's doing in verse 14 onwards, he makes a statement in verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am what? And the Greek word is fleshly, sinful. So I am carnal, sold under what? That means I am a slave to sin. And then he makes this issue. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will, I choose to do. That's what the word means. That I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. So they are here 29 21 times is putting himself in the shoes of these Jewish believers who insisted that we must keep the law in order to be saved. That's the issue here. And he keeps on saying, you know, even in verse 22, For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, the converted mind. But I see another law, another principle, another power in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. And so he cries out, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? That is spiritually dead. Do you know, folks, the word wretched appears only twice in all of the New Testament, at least in the original, only twice. This is the first time we find it, where Paul says, O wretched man that I am. Can you tell me when that word appears the second time? You should know. That's right. To the Laodicean church. When the true witness, which is Christ, says, you do not know. That's the problem. You do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That is why we must come to grips with the sin problem. So Paul is, when he uses the word law of sin in my members, he's referring to the, the, the word law is a principle. Let me give an example. You're all familiar with the law of gravity. Am I correct? Is the law of gravity pulling this Bible down? Yes or no? Why is it not falling down? What power am I using to hold it up? We call it muscle power. Is muscle power a law? Is it a constant force? No. If I hold it too much longer, the muscle power will get weak and the law will gravity win. It's the same with aeroplanes. When you're flying up there, it's defying the law of gravity. Let the guests run out <laughs> and we'll be attending your funeral. So we can challenge the law of sin, but we cannot conquer it. And that is why, folks, I've discovered in my ministry that people with very strong wills are more successful in overcoming some problems than others. I remember one member saying to me, to the members, I don't know why you had a hard time giving up coffee. I had no problem. Yeah, he was a strong, but he had other problems that he did not mention. So please remember that you can defy the law of sin in your members for a season, but ultimately it will get hold of you. So Paul ends up Romans 7 with a very true statement. With my mind, the converted mind, I serve the law of God. But with the flesh, I serve the law of sin. And which is stronger, the law of the mind or the law of sin? In your flight. Which is stronger? How many of you have used your mind to actually conquer the law of sin? None of us. So we need a savior. Okay? So that's our problem. Okay, let's go on. Mankind, as well as an angel, or the devil, has no solution to the sin nature problem. We don't have a solution. That's why every human attempt to solve the social and economic injustice of this country, the world has not succeeded. Karl Marx tried it with you know, his idea of communism and it failed. 
So please remember that we have no ability to overcome the nature of sin. Our human problem, all religions and human solutions, including pseudo-Christianity, attempt to move people from B. Barabbas to Nicodemus. I was a Catholic. I could drink beer. I could smoke. But when I became an Adventist, no more smoking, <laughs> no more beer. I changed my behavior. Did I solve the sin problem? No. I only changed my behavior, you know. So here's the, our problem. Changing their sinful behavior from bad to good. That's what every religion is based on. Only God has the solution to mankind's sin nature problem. Only God has the solution. And let's look at the solution. That solution is the truth as it is in Christ. Please turn your Bible to John chapter 1 verse 29. I want you to notice how John the Baptist introduced Jesus at the beginning of his ministry. Now remember John the Baptist was raised by God to prepare the Jewish nation to accept the Messiah. Chapter 1 of John, verse 29. The next day, John, this is John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away what? Look at the word sin. Singular or plural? Is it the verb or the noun? It's the noun. Because you see, all the sugar we've had, the orange tree, could not change the nature of the tree. Christ came primarily to solve the nature problem. You know what we did with that orange tree? <laughs> My cousin worked for the United Nations in Ethiopia. And they were experimenting, the United Nations was experimenting seedless orange trees from California. Now these are grafted plants. It was not for the public, it was only an experiment. And since he was my cousin, I said, can you give me one tree? And he did. Guess what we did? We dug out the old tree, roots and everything, and burnt it. And replaced it with this sweet, seedless orange from California, tree from California. Well, three years later, I was transferred. So I had never had the privilege, to, because it took another four years before the tree began to produce fruit. But the man who took my place, he wrote to me and he said, you know, this is the sweetest orange tree in all of Ethiopia. But there is one problem. Now he, you know, he, he didn't know much about agriculture science. Everybody wants one orange so that they can take the seed and plant it in their garden. <laughs> but this orange has no seeds. How come? I said, you'll have to come to America to know why. <laughs> That's why I told my wife. Please do not get apples, I mean, uh, grapes that have seeds in it. I like seeds, grapes. But she said, the seeds are good for you. But I said, in my age, you know, crunching those seeds <laughs> is not easy. So Christ came primarily to deal not with this. You see, when we cut down that orange tree, what happened to the oranges? Did it come down also? Yes. We, we dealt with the real problem was the tree. The moment we cut down the tree, guess what happened to the oranges? They came down too. So Christ came primarily to deal with the source of our sin problem. You, you need to realize that. Jesus came primarily to save mankind from the nature of sin. However, there is only one way Christ could have dealt with the nature of sin. Sin is a law or a force. And that is the way was to meet it head on. Okay, now remember, Paul is dealing with the, the nature of, you see in Romans 7, he's dealing with the nature of sin, that is the biggest problem that we face. Now turn, by the way, chapter 8, 1 to 4, belongs to chapter 7. I don't know where they put the, why they put the division in the wrong place. Chapter 8 begins with a, is a statement that has to do with the previous verses. There is therefore now 
no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's chapter 8 verse 1. Now there is a problem here. And I want, anyone has other translations besides the King James, the old King James. NIV, none of you have NIV? Oh, you have it. Okay, please read for us verse 1 from the NIV. Okay, anyone ha has another translation? Okay. Therefore there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Is that all? Yeah. <laughs> do you know what the King James says? Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Mm -hmm. That Paul did not write. It was added. Only one manuscript, you know, of all the manuscripts we have, only one has that. Every other manuscript has what the NIV says. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you add the second part, it looks like sanctification is the means of justification. And that is uh, much against Paul's teaching. Why is there no condemnation? Verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free, set me free from the law of sin and death. So there are two laws that were met in Christ's earthly mission. The law of sin and the law of the spirit. Two constant forces. The one that is stronger would win every time. Which force was stronger in Christ? The law of the spirit or the law of sin? The spirit. Then in verse 3, for what the law could not do, that is the law of God cannot produce righteousness through us because of the weakness of the flesh, that it was weak through the flesh. What the law could not do, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of what? And that word likeness, homomyoma in Greek, means does not mean the way the English puts it. So today, most modern, reliable scholars say the word likeness means he identified with our fallen nature. They, he used the word likeness because he did not have a sinful nature. He assumed our sinful nature. And by doing that, he condemned, on account of, on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Look at the word sin again, singular or plural. So, folks, on the cross, Christ executed the law of sin in our members. Our nature died at the cross in Christ. Our bios life, which is what makes us sinful nature. You see, the human body is not sinful. It is the driver that drives it that is caused the problem. The same body that the law of sin used you, that same body can be used by the Holy Spirit to produce righteousness. Am I correct? So the body itself is not the problem. It's the driver. Who's driving your body? The law of sin or the law of the Spirit? And the law of Spirit can only control you if there are two things. If you are born of the Spirit, number one, and if you learn to walk in the Spirit. I'll be frank with you. It was much easier to walk in the spirit when I was facing persecution in Africa than it is to walk in the spirit in the land of milk and money. Much at distractions here. In, for example, if you put, turn to chapter 13 of Romans, look at verse 14, chapter 13 and verse 14. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its last. How can Christ overcome the flesh in us when he did not overcome when he was on this earth? That is why we need to really make a deep study of the new doctrine that we introduced in 2005. Growing in Christ. You can only grow in Christ when he has redeemed us from the law of sin in our members. He condemned sin in the flesh. So please remember that Christ is the only one that can help us. And he sends the Holy Spirit who gave him victory 2000 years ago. 
who will also give us victory. So turn now to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Because the Jews face this problem all the time. And so the writer of Hebrews has to give them some help. Chapter 2 of Hebrews, verse 14 up to verse 18. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. Have you got it? He shared with our humanity. That through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, and that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed he does not give aid to angels. He did not come here to help angels. But he does give aid to the seed of what? The, seed, the children of Abraham. Are they different from us? No. Therefore in all things, have you got in how many things? All things he had to be made like his brethren. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. To make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are what? Being tempted. What does it mean? He suffered being tempted. Well, turn to First Peter. Let me help you there. First Peter. He suffered being tempted. How often do you think Christ was tempted? What does Hebrew 4.15 say? He was tempted in how many points? Like whom? Like we are. Now look at chapter 4 of 1 Peter. Verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased, ceased from what? Okay, so here are two forces that was in Christ. One, pulling him down to help to satisfy self and one to satisfy God. That's the struggle that we all go through. Remember, it gets me what Jesus said, not my will, but then do. How could he talk about his will in contradiction to God's will because he took upon our humanity. But he said, not, not my will, but whose? So by the power of the Spirit, he never yielded to the principle of self. Let me give you an example. When he was fasting up in the wilderness, he was very hungry. The devil tempted him to turn stones into what? Is it sin to eat bread? No. Is it sin to turn stones into bread? So what was the temptation? Could he turn stones into bread? Did he have the ability? Yes, because he had divine power. Separation from his father. Uh, living independent yeah. of the father. The moment he did that, he would have won. Satan would have won. So the issue was not eating bread. The issue was not turning stones into bread. The issue was using his divine power for his personal benefit. And all his life, that was the greatest temptation Christ faced. He had in himself the ability that he had as the creator of the world. So can you imagine how great was his temptation? So Christ never allowed his divine power to help his needs. Even at the cross, come down and save who? Could he do it? Yes, the other two men could not do it, but he could. So please remember the greatest temptation that Christ faced was to use his divine power to satisfy the flesh. But by the power of the Spirit, he overcame those forces. Okay, let's go on. I'm quoting you a great theologian, he, Mark Gilly, senior managing editor of Christianity Today. This is an evangelical paper. He is an evangelical scholar. And April 2012, page 34 of the magazine, 
he made this statement. And he, referring to Jesus, and he came to live among us, taking on just, not just a human body, but flesh. That is the brokenness and the sinfulness of humanity. He has become the, and I've added that, the corporate sinner who deserves to die. And he died on the cross for the very people who put him on the cross, that they might know who he really is. This is a new day, folks, when an evangelical senior managing editor of Christian Today makes this statement, you know. By condemning the law of sin and death in our corporate humanity, Christ did two things. And we read Romans 8, 2 and 3. He, co he conquered sin and the grave. I want you to look at Romans 8, verse 11. Very important statement that Paul makes here. Romans chapter 8 and look at verse 11. And after reading, I'm going to ask you some questions, okay? Romans 8, verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, talking to believers, he who raised dead from Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. Okay, let me ask you the question. We know from the Roman historian Celsus and Cicero, it takes between three to seven days to die on the cross. Very slow lingering death. Jesus died within a few hours. So here's my question. What killed Christ? What killed him? Was it the cross? No. Why did they break the legs of the two criminals? Why? No, no, no. That's not, they, was, they were crucified. You see, when a person is crucified, he has to raise his body to breathe out. You break their legs, he cannot do that. They die instantly. So they broke their legs so that they could die what? Or otherwise they would be there for two, three, four days, you know. So sin killed Jesus. Whose sin killed him? Our sin. Very good. When sin kills, how long does it kill you for? What is the wages of sin? What kind of death? First or second? Let me put it this way. When you got an appointment to the doctor or to the dentist, you go to his office and he is not yet ready to see you. So you sit in his, off, in his lobby and maybe ma read some magazines or there is a fishbowl that you watch. You see, the first that was a necessity because of the gospel. When God said to Adam, the day you sin you shall die, he did not mean, mean the first death. Because if the people living 6,000 years ago did not die, boy, this church would be overcrowded long ago. So, the first death is God's way of keeping you waiting. <laughs> yeah, that's his fishbowl, but, but he doesn't have a fishbowl. He just puts you to sleep until the day of judgment. So the first death was a necessity because of the gospel. If there was no gospel, Adam would have died the very day he sinned. So would you in him. But because there is a gospel, he allowed Adam to live and produce children and they produced children until you and I were born. So what happened to the first people that Adam produced? They died. If they did not die, what would happen? This, church, this world would have been overcrowded long, long ago, before you and I were born. So, the sleep death, the way you have seen is the second death. So, our sins put Christ in the grave, killed him. But here's the good news, our sin could not keep him down. The fact that the Holy Spirit raised him up proved that the power of the Spirit is greater than all the sins of the world put together. So sin may put you in the grave, but sin cannot keep you there. Jesus conquered the power of sin, which is eternal death. Jesus tasted the second death. He experienced it. He surrendered to it. But 
our sins could not keep him up, folks. It raised. And the power that raised him up is the Holy Spirit. That same Spirit is dwelling where now? In us. So can that Spirit give you victory over the flesh? Yes. But I want to make it very clear. That Spirit does not give you victory in order to save you. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever teach that the Holy Spirit is a co-redeemer. We have only one redeemer for Jesus Christ. Mary is not a co-redeemer, neither is the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit is to reproduce in us the victory, the righteousness of Christ as the fruit of salvation. Okay, so number one, Christ... Okay, okay. Our sins put Christ in the grave, okay? It should have put him there for how long? Forever. You know, I was sitting with a Baptist pastor in a theological seminary in Kenya. You know, he was a Baptist pastor. He, uh, you know, most Protestant uh, seminaries teach a class called the Four Cults. You know who the Four Cults are? Mormons, Christian Science, Jehovah Witness, and guess who number four is? And he told the student, this is a very pa a strong training. It's five years after 14th grade, which is the British system, A level, not O level, which is 12th grade. Five years, three years of Greek and two years of Hebrew. These are bright kids. And he told the students, you know, when you enter the ministry next year, you will meet no more. Because at that time, they have changed now, but at that time, they did not believe blacks could be saved. You will meet very few Christian science because they have had poor success. And you will meet a few Jehovah Witnesses because most of Africa banned the Jehovah Witnesses because they refused to salute the flag. So here you can burn the American flag, but in Africa you touch the flag, they'll shoot you. But everywhere you go, he said, you will meet Adventists. We were at that time, and maybe still are, the largest union in the world field in terms of members per capita. It's always the two unions or divisions. East Africa or Inter-America? America is down. North America is down. The, 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 the. So he said, everywhere you go, you will meet Seventh-day Adventists. Would you like me to invite one of their pastors who know how to handle them? <laughs> and they said yes. So he writes a letter to our president. And he calls, the president calls me and says, Jack, you're the minister secretary. Please go and defend. Now in Africa, our universities and colleges they don't have the entertainment that American colleges have. You know, here it's windy, you can go flying with, you know, wings. You know. It's snowing, you can go snowmobile or skiing. Africans don't have that privilege. One of the things they enjoy is debating. They love to debate. So when they heard that I was coming, they went to their lab and read everything they could about us both from our own people, scholars, and from other scholars. So I went two hours before my time to see what they had about us. I was shocked. They had almost all the G. White books in their library. They had Movement of Destiny, that questions on doctrine. <laughs> in the magazine rack, they had, were subscribing to our ministry magazine put by the GC. They were subscribing to Desmond Ford's paper, Evangelica. They were subscribing to a paper called Pilgrim's Rest or something that puts all the dirty linen about our church. So I said, there's nothing I can hide from these students. So I went to the professor's office after, I, I spent two hours in the library, looking what they had about us, also from the other non adventist scholars. So I introduced myself and the professor said to me, he was a Baptist from England, he was a, you know, at least from Wales. He said to me, I said to him, you know, I'm the one coming here to defend the Adventist church. And he said, when the other students heard you were coming, they want to be in the debate. So we are not having this in the classroom, we are having it in the chapel. I hope you don't mind. I said, sure, it doesn't matter. We went to the chapel. It was packed. Not the students, but they were training pastors for four denominations. Lutheran, Baptist, Pentecostal, and uh, one more. Presbyterian. They were training pastors of four denominations. And this place was packed, not only with students, but missionaries from these four denominations. So I said to the guy, this looks like a firing squad. 
And he said, they'll be tough on you. And I said to him, you know, you can play the game. So after introduction, this fifth year senior student stand up, very cocky. He says, can you defend the Seventh-day Adventist doctrine of the investigative judgment in the light of justification by faith? Now, I had no problem with the question. I had a problem with his attitude. And I said, young man, you know, in Africa, you respect older men. You are not respecting me, so I'm going to embarrass you in front of your student. And he said, try me. So I said, do you believe in a judgment? He said, yes. Do you believe that believers will have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ? He was hesitant. So I said, can you read for me Romans 14, verse 10, where Paul says to Christians, stop judging each other. Every one of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. He said, okay, I'll accept that. Here's my third question. Do you believe that we will be judged and rewarded according to our works? He said, no way. I said, I would like to quote you two men. I'm not sure you know the first one. Who it is? I said, Jesus Christ. And I made him read John 5, 28 and 29. But Jesus says, all that are in the grave will be resurrected and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. And he said, you know, I've never read that text before. I said, I know. And then I gave him 2 Corinthians 5, 10, where Paul says the same thing. And he said, I haven't read that text either. <laughs> I said, here's the problem. There are of text in the New Testament that on the surface seem to contradict each other. One group of texts says we are justified by faith apart from the works of the law, apart from good deeds, purely by grace. And you evangelicals love this text. But there's a second group of texts, and I gave him a whole bunch of them, that says that we are judged and rewarded according to our works. I said, do you believe that these two groups of texts are inspired? And he said, yes. Can you reconcile these two groups of text for me? And he said, I'm sorry, I cannot do it. And then I said, would you like the Seventh-day Adventist pastor to help you? <laughs> and the whole congregation burst out laughing. I said, you deserve it. I said, there's a third group of text which says genuine justification by faith always produces works. Some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. These works don't save us, but they're the evidence of salvation. I took him to many texts, but one to James, where James says that when Abraham offered Isaac, you know, he left it up the knife, it proved that not his righteousness, but his faith was perfect. Because God was testing his faith. So I said, you know, Jesus brings up our works of faith, not works of the law, but the works of faith, to prove not our righteousness, but our faith in whom? In him. And so Jesus says to the devil, these people are resting in me for their salvation. Can you show one sin in me, Jesus says to the devil. Can you do that? No. Not John 14, 30 says, Satan has come and can find nothing in him. And then Christ says to the devil, I rebuke you. You have no claim on these people. They are mine. And once he passes the judgment, then he'll come to take us home. And the Professor, who was sitting behind, you know, <laughs> Baptist, he said, he stood up, is this what your church teaches? And I said, am I not a Seventh-day Adventist? <laughs> I didn't want to answer the question. Because <laughs> he had books in the library that, you know, may have contradicted what I thought. He took me for lunch, you know, and guess what? His wife cooked an excellent vegetarian meal. <laughs> and then we got into a discussion over the state of the dead. He was a Baptist. And he said, I said to him, you, you believe in hellfire? He said, yes. Do you believe that Jesus paid the price for your sin? Oh, of course, he said. Well, if he paid the price for your sin and wages of sin is burning in the hell forever, Christ should be in the fire today. Otherwise, God is being unjust. And no, he said, I've never thought of that. And then I gave him Jude 7. You know what Jude 7 says? That the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in eternal fire is evidence of how the wicked will be destroyed. I said, is Sodom and Gomorrah burning today? He says, no. So I said to him, you know, you're a scholar, so I can tell you something that you can investigate. The word everlasting has two applications. Either the thing itself is everlasting, or the effect is everlasting. The effect of accepting the gospel is everlasting life. The effect of rejecting the gospel is everlasting death. I gave him several texts. 
And he said, boy, you gave me something to think about. Do you know three months later he called me by phone. He said, Jack, your church is right. The wages of sin is not hellfire. It is annihilated. He said, I have to change my position even though it may cost me my job. He was a sincere Christian. You know, so we have, we, we must never be afraid to defend our teaching. So number one, when Christ conquered the grave, he conquered the most powerful force of sin. The powerful, the most powerful force of sin is to put you where? In the, the wage of sin is what? Goodbye to life forever. And he conquered that. Number two, he objectively, I covered that already, saved how many people? All of humanity. By the obedience of Christ, justification unto life came, past tense, to the entire human race. That's the gift. And Titus 2.11 says the same thing. Number three, he gives believers the hope of living holy lives. And I want you to look sometime, or even John 13, 34 and 35. The greatest evidence, Jesus said, that will prove to non-believers that we are the disciples of Christ is not because we keep the right day, not because we don't eat pork, not because we have the correct clothing, you know. Because all this is an issue, you know. It's <laughs> I will tell you, we have a dear sister, wonderful lady, she works for the Minnesota Conference, you know. She was asked to preach to the Ethiopian church. And she did something that Africans will, cannot accept. Their culture will not accept a woman preaching wearing trousers or slacks. And she, they were horrified, you know. It was in the winter, it was cold, so she wore slacks. And they told her, you don't dare do that. So she asked me, you know, because we are good friends. I said, Jenny, uh, her name is uh, Karen. Karen, in African culture, you do not wear slacks when you come to church, whether you're preaching or not. It's always a dress. <laughs> That's their culture. In fact, if you ever go to Africa as a missionary, ladies, don't you ever wear jeans. Don't you ever take jeans. Because in Africa, jeans are worn only by prostitutes. Or men, don't you ever take your golf clubs. Because golf is played only by the elite. You are identifying yourself with the top knobs, you know. So, you know, we have to, you know, adapt ourselves to the culture of the people. So, my dear people, the greatest evidence, Jesus said, that will convince the world that we are his disciples, is when we love one another in the same way that Christ loved us unconditionally. And when I go to churches where there's fighting like cats and dogs, <laughs> and most churches there is problems, then we are not demonstrating the power of the gospel. You know, we will never agree in everything. In my churches, I had four churches in this country, I had a policy. In fundamentals, we have to be united. In non-fundamentals, there has to be charity. And in non-essentials, there has to be liberty. Because I had 45 nationalities in my church in D.C. And it was not a black and white issue. It was African Americans versus West Indies. They fought like cats and dogs. <laughs> We need to respect each other. So what we did during the song service, you know, at the beginning of the divine worship, we began with songs that the young people loved, you know. We didn't have drums or anything, but we used songs that, you know, they liked. And we ended with the solemn songs that the older folks liked. So we pleased both groups, you know. And we, we went well. So one day, I said to the president of the GC, why don't we have a prayer breakfast for the embassies, because you know, we had 83 embassies around our church. We were in D.C. And we had 400 embassies for that prayer breakfast. And I will not forget what the Romanian ambassador said to me. He said, you know, when your church has problems in Romania, and I know my government sometimes gives your church problems, please call me. I will defend your church in Romania. And of course, the, ambas the diplomat for South Africa was an Adventist. <laughs> and he said, I stopped going to church because in South Africa, we still practice apartheid. And he said, I know that in Amer the eastern part of America, 
you still have two conferences, black and white. But I see in your church, you have 45 nationalities, even some of them are South African. How did you do it? And I explained to them, the gospel set us free. In Christ, there is no male, no female, no Jew, no Gentile, no black, no white. We are all one in whole. And I'll tell you folks, if our members in Rwanda had understood this, there would have been no genocide in 94. We were the second largest denomination in Rwanda. One out of seven Rwandese was the Seventh-day Adventist. But their tribe was more important than their relationship to Christ. So we had, and it's very interesting, we had husbands killing wives, wives killing husbands, we had pastors killing members, members killing pastors. All Adventists. Now this happened in the other denomination also. So the GC sent me there. Why did this happen? And I realized these church members had not understood the gospel. They knew the doctrines. And I spoke to this, many of them who actually did the killing. And I was shocked. They were told by their pastors, um, sunset Saturday to sunset to Friday, you can do all the killing. But sunset Friday to sunset Saturday, there has to be no killing because it's the Lord's Sabbath. And you know, I thought, man, this is exactly what happened at the cross. The Sabbath is about to be, <laughs> bring the body down. I was amazed, you know. And I spoke to some of them who actually did the killing. And they all gave me the same answer, folks. We have no explanation. One man said to me, the only thing we can explain is that the Lord withdrew the Holy Spirit and the devil took over. They had no explanation. They are horrified what they did. Many of them are still in prison. And we have church service now in prison in Rwanda because the, the case has not yet come up. This is years, 94, since 94. So my dear people, Christ has given us the ability to live a life that reflects the glory of our God, the love of our God. Okay, one more. Christ, resurrection made possible the blessed hope of the resurrection. You know, folks, we are all looking forward to the second coming of what? Why? That's my question is why? Is it because you want to walk, of, walk on streets of gold? <laughs> or as my kids said when they were young, so that they could ride a saber-toothed tiger? <laughs> or is it because you can be with Jesus Christ? What is your motivation for the second coming? Is it, you know, when you have all the streets of gold, gold becomes valueless. <laughs> it's like stones on the ground, you know. But anyway, so, 1 Corinthians 15 brings up this blessed hope. And the blessed hope is this corruption will put on what? And this mortal will put on immortality. Folks, all the struggle that you and I are going through today will disappear. Because now we will have a human nature and a converted mind that are perfect harmony. Now we have a, a mind that wants to serve God and a flesh that wants to serve sin. All that will go. Thank God for it. Okay, now. However, it is not until the second advent, the resurrection of the believers, that the sin nature problem in us will be removed subjectively and we will be made righteous. You know, I've given you this truth, like already I've spoken, used this before. We are waiting for the second coming of Christ so that this corruption may put on what? Incorrupt. This vile body may become like his glorious body. Until then, our righteousness in performance in justice and in nature is only where in Christ even after probation closes yes you you know they say that we must overcome sinning I, I'll be frank with you how many of you have been persecuted for being Christian See, this is a free country but when you go through persecution when your life is in danger and they tried to kill me more than once in Uganda and in Ethiopia I'll tell you what happens all the temptation that you face here disappears. It's a matter of life and death. What is being tested is your faith. You, you cannot overeat ice cream. You don't even feel like eating at all. The, you know, there is no temptation of the flesh 
when you are facing persecution. Because now it's a matter of life and death. And I'll tell you, we have to have a faith that is unshakable, even though we feel Christ has forsaken us. Okay, let's go on. You can, I, I've given that term. This is the full significance of the everlasting gospel that God raised the Advent movement to proclaim to the world before the end come. The three angel message of Christ our right is the everlasting gospel. Okay? It is this everlasting gospel that will prepare Christians for the great tribulation, war of Armageddon. This is the final showdown in the great controversy between Christ and Satan. Sometime you have, please read Luke 18, verses 1 to 8, the parable there. I just want you to look at the conclusion. When the Son of Man comes, will he find what on earth? Faith. That's what he wants looking for. I have mentioned Isaiah 54. Let me read it in closing. Isaiah 54, verse 5 to 8. Because this is what the issue is. You see, all the martyrs before, in the first three centuries and under communism, all the martyrs, when they were facing death, they sensed the presence of God. But this time, in the time of trouble, that will not be true. Turn to Isaiah, chapter 54, where this gospel prophet explains the issue. Verse 5 to 8. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. So this is clearly speaking about the Messiah. He is called the God of the whole earth. For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit like a youthful wife when you were refused, says your God. Now this may not make sense to you. In the days of Isaiah, when a man got married, he paid a bride price. If he did not like his wife, he would write a divorce letter and he would send her home to the parents. The parents had to pay back the bride price. They did not want to do that. So they would say to her, I'm sorry, you belong to him. And he would say, I don't want you. So she felt forsaken. Now remember in those days, there was no food stamps. There was, you know, none of the privileges that we have in this country existed then. We had the same problem in Africa. You know, in Africa, polygamy is very common. So when a man, a polygamist, who had four wives, became an Adventist, he could keep only one. But very interesting, I have yet to see one of those guys who kept the first wife. His first wife was about his age. His fourth wife was about 15 years old and he was 60 years old. He always kept her. So I would ask them, why? You are supposed to keep the first wife. He said, no, no, no. The first wife, the second and third was arranged by my parents. But this one I really love. That's, they always gave me that excuse. They, now they had to pay a bride price. It's very interesting. The bride price was based on the education of the woman, the girl that they married. So very often you would have a man with a high degree, maybe a bachelor's, a master's degree. His wife may have had only three years of education because that's all he could afford. So there was very little compare, I mean, you know, there were problems socially between the husband and wife. So he, they would send the wife back to the home and the parents said, no, they, they wouldn't pay the, the money. But the, it was not money. It was mostly cows and goats and sheep. Many of these women, because the husband would say, I, no, I cannot take you back because my church won't allow me. That's the excuse they gave. My church won't allow me. Many of these women became prostitutes to survive. Because they had 10, 15 churches, the children. So I fought and I fought with the GC. I said, you can't apply the church manual that is okay in America to Africa. All the other denominations allowed the polygamists to keep the other wives. What would Christ do? Well, what did he do in the Old Testament? <laughs> 
and I pleaded with the brethren. Finally, they took an action, which is now existing. He has to keep only one wife, but he has to look after the others and their kids. To do that, they had to stay in the same compound. So who supervised him? That's another question. Otherwise, these women, and this is exactly what Isaiah is saying. Verse 6, For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife when you were refused. Refused by whom? By your husband. Say your God. And remember, the husband here, he's talking spiritually, is our maker, our redeemer. For a mere moment, please don't ask me how long is the mere moment, okay? I have forsaken you. But with great mercies, I will gather you. With a little wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Can God produce a people who will prove that the, their faith is greater than all the forces that the devil can put on them? In other words, can God produce a people who will demonstrate the faith of Jesus. Not the faith in Jesus. All believers have that. The faith of Jesus. Because if you read the book on Calvary, in Bizarre of Ages, when the devil tempted to come down and save himself, she ends up with this word, by faith he was victorious. He could not see the father's face. His feelings were negative. But he knew by faith that his father had not forsaken him. And by faith he was victorious. That's the kind of faith that God wants to produce to demonstrate in the great controversy, which is our next study, that God's, the faith of Jesus is greater than all the forces of evil. So my dear people, let me end up with some quotations from Alan G. White. Glad in the armor of Christ's righteousness, the church is to enter upon her final what? Conflict. Prophets Prof 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 and Kings 7 to 5. That faith which will live through the time of trouble must be in daily exercise now. Spiritual gifts, volume 4, 136. Living faith in the merits of a crucified redeemer will carry them, God's people, through the fiery furnace of afflictions and trials. Testimonies of, for the church, volume 4, page 214. The, he who testifies to this thing says, yes, I'm coming soon. Do you want to catch the third? You can get this, this CD, you know. He may charge you. This guy, Rick, may charge you. Okay. Can I go now and finish it? Yeah, okay. He who testifies to this thing says, yes, I'm coming soon. So, folks, before Christ can come, he has to prove that the power of the gospel is greater than all the forces of the devil. And he can only do it ultimately through the church. To the last generation of Christians. But that we'll deal, we'll deal with in our next study. Okay. May that day come what? Soon. And you know when I look at the world today. Russia, Ukraine, Iraq. And you know the world is so small that even our country has to be involved in it. <laughs> How much can our country do? You know, there's only a limit. And these radicals are getting stronger and stronger. And our poor Christians in Iraq are being persecuted. It's the same in other parts of the, the world, you know. It will come here, folks, one day. Because the gospel will divide the world in only two camps. 1 John 5, we belong to God, the rest of the world is swayed by the evil one. So, the time is near folks, and I want and plead with God to please turn our church around to understand this message of Christ and righteousness. It's our only hope. Okay, let us pray. Loving Father, we thank you. We thank you that in Jesus Christ we have salvation, full and complete. We can't add to it, we can't add it, we can't improve on it. We can only accept it with grateful hearts. Lord, may our faith rest in him and him alone, 
who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Lord, our church is later. The world is groping in darkness. The future looks bleak. But we know, Lord, that you are greater than all the forces of evil. Bless this church, may it grow in grace and truth, and bless our denomination, that it may return to the full gospel that you gave our church many, many years ago. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. How long break do you need? <laughs>